Not me. <laughs> Meaning I'm still Bridget. I'm still an alcoholic. Still hey, Bridget. <laughs> Sober today by the grace of God and the program Alcoholics Anonymous. My sobriety date was like two weeks ago. Yet yeah. tomorrow. Oh, cool. Hold on, I'm busy. <laughs> I got sober on or about November 14th of 1986. And for those of you that are like trying to do the math really quick. Oh my God, 1986. Because that's what I do. Okay, she's been sober like 35 years this, this month. Holy oh, yeah. I was like, who does that? Right? Who does that? Who doesn't drink for 35 years? That's ridiculous. Sheree, you're amazing. Sheree is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, and she is incredibly suspicious. Um, <laughs> She's one of those girls that walked into AA with the heels, you know, and she comes into AA, right, with legs all the way up to her hind end. And we entered the room, you know, and everybody knew it. And she's beautiful, and she's young, and she's super articulate. I don't know where she got it. She ain't just, you know, and she's amazing. She has blossomed into one of the, my favorite members of Alcoholics Anonymous of all time. She's busier than anybody I, I know. She's doing her first round as a GSR. Nice. <laughs> right? She's fired up. She's active on all three sides. She's sponsoring. She works steps. She honors our traditions. She cares. She knows the concepts, I think. She knows the concepts. Yeah. And she, she's got a love and... And not only a love, but an appreciation for Alcoholics Anonymous that's absolutely unbridled and absolutely unequal. And she's just a phenomenal person. It's fun to watch her entire family recover. It's a family disease, a family illness that we suffer, and it's family recovery that we get to have. And it's a privilege to walk this, this path with you. Thank you for allowing me to be part of it. And, and the other pieces, she'll say yes to anything. <laughs> so when I said, hey... And it was a text. I've got the text. We, we checked. What are you doing November 23rd? I said, you want to go down to Seattle? She's, I, she's like, sure, by text. I said, dress nice. So she shows up in my house today in jeans. She, there was plenty of time for her to go get slacks on. But I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, no, it'll be fine. So here she sits saying yes. Uh, saying yes. Um, so thank you. Thank you for allowing me to, to walk beside you this journey, this amazing journey. Thanks for allowing me to come. This is fun. Um, I, uh, I got sober in November of 1986. I, was, I, I got sober in a remote community. And just so you know, December 4th, you're going to print some of those out, flyers? Yes. December 4th, we're having a remote community forum. It is Spanish interpreted. Thank you, God. We just got approved for that. Otherwise, we would have advertised it a lot sooner. It's going to be on Zoom, and it's going to be phenomenal. We've got people coming from everywhere to talk, so it's going to be fun. A remote community is forum. Remote community is is any place any th place that it's hard to reach the message of Alcoholics Anonymous because of geography, culture, or language. And that's how I got sober. I got sober on an island in the middle of the North Pacific in 1986. I got sober in Kodiak, Alaska, and I was 19 years old. I got, so I got sober. It was me and a bunch of old men. Yeah. I know. Hard to believe, right? Uh -huh. What they got. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I entered the room like this. <laughs> right? With my legs all, up, all the way up to my hind end and my blonde hair hanging all the way down to my hind end. They met in the middle. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and here I was in Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't possibly be an alcoholic. How could I possibly be an alcoholic? I was far too young and I was still far too cute and I had still had a nice ass. Yes. <laughs> How could I possibly be an alcoholic? Yeah. So I came in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. Definitely a drug addict. I was five foot nine, oh eight, eighty six pounds. Might be a little bit of a outside issues that I was dealing with, but couldn't possibly be an alcoholic. My old timers said, don't worry about it, kid. Just come back. Just come to the next meeting. See, because they knew the language of the heart. Their alcohol, your alcoholic talks to my alcoholic. 
And their alcoholic spoke the language of the heart to me. They didn't judge me because of how I walked, how I talked, what I wore, what I didn't wear. <laughs> and what the things that I thought said didn't and, and the behaviors that I exhibited. They were not the arbiter of my sex conduct. Thank God, because they would have killed me. They didn't say, you will X, Y, Z and jump through this, 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 and this hoop. They said, don't worry about a kid, just come back. And they met me where I was at. And that's what I needed. That's the 12 step that I needed when I came in Alcoholics Anonymous because I was constitutionally incapable of being human. I, I communicated in a series of grunts and clicks. We were having a good conversation on the way down here. And um, <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody, but if I do, <laughs> B-R-I, D-G-E-T, for your fourth step, okay? <laughs> I end up on everybody's fourth step. It's cool, I'm good with it, but damn it, make sure you spell it right. All right? That's right. So, so we're on our way down here, and, and I see the, the um, what do you call them, like tent cities, the, the homeless encampments, the tents and stuff. And I looked over and went, wow, thanks, thanks God that that's not me there, but for God's grace, go I. And then I, I chuckled to myself and went, <laughs> horse shit. I'm sorry, I shouldn't cuss. I cuss. I said horse crap. I never ended up there. I never would have ended up there. See, I learned early on that I'm sitting on a gold mine and I never, I was never homeless. I was lived, I lived in a lot of hotel and motel rooms, but I was never homeless. See, that's the thing is, and, and Sheree happens to work in a, um, uh, uh, with homeless and, um, she said, you know, most of them are men because they don't have the resources that we women have. <laughs> and that's my story. That was a lot of my story. I, I'm from here. I'm from Des Moines. I was born and raised down in Des Moines. My dad was a SeaTac guy, you know. My whole family has a lot to do with airplanes. <laughs> and, uh, and I learned early on how to get by. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous with all the with all the childhood trauma, the drama, trauma, and tragedy. I had the things happen to me that's not supposed to happen to little girls, and it happened to me because I'm I'm the young, well not because I'm the youngest of eight kids, and uh, by the time I came around, my parents were done raising kids, and so for me, I was left to fend for myself quite a bit. I was left. I was left by myself, unexpectedly. Uh, what do you call it? Like accidentally left by myself from the time I was like five, like five years old. My parents would take off and go to the bar or wherever they were going to go, figuring that one of the other kids was there at the house because there's a whole herd of them. They figured that there's somebody there to take care of me, and oftentimes there wasn't, so I'm left by myself. Just so you know, microwaves had just made their deb debut on the world. I can micro, I'm a microwave master chef, man. <laughs> I can, I, we were just talking about Thanksgiving. <laughs> my mom, somebody, somebody said, oh, you know, to my mom, what are you making for Thanksgiving? And my mom said, oh, shit, we're going to, I'm going to nuke a turkey roast in the micro. <laughs> I actually said that this last week. I said, oh, shit, I'm going to nuke a turkey roast in the micro. And I think it was Mo. He goes, can you do that? <laughs> Can you really do that in a microwave? <laughs> Damn kid, darn kids don't know nothing these days. <laughs> so I came into Alcoholics Anonymous with all that baggage, thinking that that's what made me an alcoholic. And if my mom would, my parents would just behave, if you people would just treat me right, then everything would be better. I'd be fine. Wouldn't be an alcoholic. <laughs> You're the reason that I am this way. You know, and I had a big capital V on my forehead for victim. Then I found out it meant volunteer, you little rat bastards. <laughs> <laughs> and I came in thinking that that's what made me an alcoholic. You know, thinking, well, daddy was a Petri dish and mama was, had a square nipple or whatever. And that's the reason. And you told me that's not what makes me an alcoholic. What happened for me was not, I didn't have the sponsorship that we have today. Today we have people, we got people taking people line by line through the big book. That ain't what we did back in my day. 
Sorry, we were made to do this crazy thing called reading it. <laughs> and they said, if you can't read it, one will be provided for you. Oh no, that's a different meeting. Um, they said, if you can't read it, come to the big book study and ask questions and talk. And so I did on Monday night at St. James Fisherman, we had the Monday night big book study. And we go and they, we'd look up words in this thing that this thing that used to exist, it's called a dictionary. Today, all I have to do is say, Google, what page is whatever, <laughs> you know? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. But I could find pages quicker than I ever could before. <laughs> and so we'd look up the words in the dictionary and, and they'd say, don't worry about it, kid, just come back. Because see, I couldn't read by myself. I couldn't sit down and read the book because because of the way my brain worked, I'd have to read a paragraph like a half a dozen times just to kind of start being able to get my three brain cells to align with the moon, <laughs> right? And I'd have to read it over and over and over. And when you're me and your brain is so fried and you're 19 years old, that's the best I did. So we used to carry our big books to meetings. This is the original case. This is not the original big book. This one's like two years old. Not, not lying. Um, I say that only to brag, just so you know. Um, and we carry our big books to, to meetings because when somebody would quote the big book, we would read along. They'd say, hey, and on page whatever it is, this is what it says. And I'd read along and I'd follow along. And they'd say things like, they talk about acceptance on page 449. Don't ask me, is, is it 417 or 419 now? I don't know. 17. Anyway, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> they talk about that. And that's how I learned how to read the book. Was by going to those book studies and following along and listening and following along when people would quote it in the meetings. So if you, I encourage you, if you're not reading big books, if you're not taking your big book to the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're not taking the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous to your meetings, you're leaving a bad impression for our newcomers. Put that one on your resentment list. <laughs> B-R-I-D-G-E-T. <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff that we got to think about today. I went into a hall meeting, uh, this was a few years ago, and twice in one week at Dry Dock, twice in one week, They were doing, you know how they pass out how it works before? They passed out how it works. I said, that's okay, I'll read it from the big book. They're like, what? I said, yeah, how it works, big book. They're like, because they have those sheets, you know, the, the, yeah. the laminated stuff. Twice in one week, two different people did not know that how it works was in the big book. Ever since then, I'm still doing inventory on that one. <laughs> Can you tell? Does it show? <laughs> R-E, yeah. So my old timers made us read the bit. It had told me, just come to the big book study. And what, the, what we would do is, see, we didn't have like a lot of big active service structure like y'all have here. This is phen phenomenal here. We didn't have this big thing. GSR was like, oh. You know, somebody huge, right? The GSR. Now I know it just stands, it stands for geezer. Um, but, <laughs> but it was a big deal. And the books would come from GSO. I just ordered like a half a dozen of the new service manual. <gasps> I'm so excited about the new service manual. Oh my gosh. It's red. Like whorehouse red. It's kind of cool. I feel right at home. <laughs> so they wouldn't, they, we didn't have this huge service structure. What we would, what would happen is we'd get the books in from GSO. It would take like, like six, eight weeks to get an order in from GSO because we had to fill out the forms and then mail it in and then it'd have to come back. It'd take forever to get these books. And we'd get these boxes and they were huge boxes from GSO and we would unpack them. Oh my gosh, it was so cool. And they're big books and we'd smell the big books and they would smell new. You know, and we had living sober and came to believe. We didn't have like the, what's the meditation one, the daily reflections, but we had the, the books. And that was so cool. So they didn't, we didn't take, we didn't do the, uh, the very disciplined stuff we have today. 
because there wasn't 537,000 people to sponsor me. There was one chick, her name was Lori. She got drunk when I got six months. Uh, move on, <laughs> right? But what they do is they would model the traditions for me. They would model unity for me. They would model how to, how to get a resentment and write it on a piece of paper and share it with the sponsor. And then they'd go and they, the, you know, uh, Joe and Chato went out back behind the meeting hall and made amends. I think there was some chair throwing in there, but they made amends. And they'd come in patting each other on the back, loving on one another. And we learned how to get along. See, up in Kodiak, Alaska, on an island and up there, your life depends. In Alcoholics Anonymous, my life depends on us staying together. Your life depends on us staying together. It's even more so up there. See, if town runs out of milk, somebody's got to have milk. And if town runs out of meat, if the planes ain't flying and the boats ain't going, you're left. It's a remote community. So we learned how to get along and the traditions were all modeled for me. And we learned things about the primary purpose that I never really got the clue about. See, I didn't honor the traditions. I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know what the traditions were until I'd gone through the steps a couple of times and realized, it took me a while to realize there was other people in the world. But that's when I started needing the traditions. When I started realizing that, oh, wow, my head popped out of my butt for long enough to realize there's other people in the universe. And now I got to figure out how to get along with you people. Ugh, I'm still not great at it. I'm not. I am incredibly antisocial. I'm not. I'm just, you know, I would rather have my eyes scooped out with spoons than just, just be like small talk. I just, I don't know how to do it. I know that I'm supposed to ask three questions. <laughs> oh, really? You went to Europe. Where did you go? Oh, Germany, Austria. Beautiful. And do you have a dog? Oh, really? What kind of dog? Is your dog very active? You know, how old is your dog? <laughs> so I learned these little skills. But beyond that, man, please don't make me do anything else. <laughs> don't ask me about the holidays. <laughs> I don't, I just, it's not comfortable for me. Because I'm scared. Because I'm scared that you won't like me. You know, I hate. It's like ugh, now I gotta go talk. <gasps> what if they don't like me? What if they do? What if they don't? What if somebody shoots me? <laughs> what if I piss somebody off? You know, because it's very important that you <laughs> like me. Sorry. See, my ego needs it. Stroke, stroke my ego. So that's where I got sober. I got sober in Alaska and, and, and in a remote community and, and the steps were modeled for me. I'd see them, they gotta be on the wall somewhere. There, <laughs> I know they're there somewhere. And I looked up there and I'd sit in the room and I'd look up on the wall whenever they, we didn't have those, those highfalutin printed things. We had them written, handwritten every week, Friday, handwritten on the chalkboard, one through 12 wow. and then erased and then rewritten every week, and then erased, and then rewritten. We didn't have these highfalutin things. The hoity-toity, y'all are spoiled, right? And so I'd look up there, and i go, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Oh, hell yeah, that's an easy one. Yeah, alcohol, and whatever. Life had become unmanageable. Yep, absolutely, check, done with step one. Came to believe that a power greater, yep, okay, I'll take that one, yeah, something's got to help, okay, chick, made a decision, yeah, okay, okay, you got that, yep, okay, good, made a decision, <laughs> admitted to God to myself, yeah, you know, so I, I or made a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself, and my, you know, my sponsor, Lorraine, said, uh, you know, Bridget, you got to put pen to paper on this one, and I said, okay. So I put some pen to paper about how, you know, daddy was mean, mama had a square nipple and, you know, all of that stuff. Creepy Uncle Bob, <laughs> creepy Uncle Charlie. 
You should have seen what happened when I arrived for my fifth step with that. <laughs> she was kind. She didn't say, here, go do it again. She said, come on, let's sit down and have a talk. She said, let's talk about how you showed up in this. And then she explained the big V that was on my forehead. Does not mean victorious. <laughs> and all of those steps were modeled for me. And I was, I was brought into Alcoholics Anonymous and I was surrounded with love, with kindness. And I was modeled hope. You guys taught me hope. My first year of sobriety was kind of crazy. I got sober, well, I actually got sober in September, October, like November 10th or so, I took a bong hit. Sorry, I talked about drugs. <laughs> I took a bong hit and then I, changed, I went to the noon meeting the next day and said, explained to Sherry, Sherry W. Who, you know, yeah, we'll get there. I explained to her that it was pot. This is AA, okay? <laughs> and I didn't drink, all right? She wasn't buying any of it. <laughs> I didn't like her very much. And she explained to me how that we define abstinence as com complete uh, abstinence from all mind and mood altering chemicals. And I just thought that was dumb. But whatever. <laughs> She said, look, because I had my 30 and my 60, uh, we had key tags back then for AA. She said, you give me those, the 30 and the 60 back, and I'll give them to you when you get your 30 and your 60 back. I said, okay, fine. And I let her have those key tags. I never saw her again. She was a Coast Guard wife, Sherry W. If any of you see her, okay? <laughs> so I got a bone to pick with her, all right? I never saw those key chains again but I got my 30 and 60 back, apparently. I got sober, uh, my sobriety date is November, on or about November 14th. That went long, night, November 14th, 1986. I decided that, you know, they told me that I couldn't keep selling dope, turning tricks and stay sober. I couldn't do those things and stay sober. So I went fishing um, <laughs> and I went out in, in May for a hell of an opener among a few other fisheries. Deadliest catch, yeah, I did that. Anyway, um, so in May of 87, I got back to town and I called Seattle and they said that my dad had been diagnosed with cancer and that I could <coughs> probably get down here. And uh, so the people in AA bought me a plane ticket and flew me down here. And um, before I got on the plane, my old timers pulled me aside and they said, they said, kid, I'm going to clean this up. They said, kid, don't F this up. I didn't know what they were talking about. Today, what I know was, look, you've got one opportunity at an event. See, apparently they knew he had, he had Hodgkin's. And um, they knew that that wasn't a good thing. And this might be the last time I see him. So they said, don't F this up. And I didn't know what they meant. So I came down here. I saw my dad for one day. My dad saw me for one day, stone cold sober. Mind you, I had clothes on and a chain going from an ear to my nose, earring to my nose ring. It was very, I'm, I'm sure it was very wonderful to see for my father. But, uh, but I was stone cold sober, about four, five, six months sober. And I had just found out that I was pregnant. I know it's shocking, right? <laughs> that was May of 1987. June, July, August 23rd of 1987, I got a phone call. They said that I'm still pregnant. I had decided to give my son, my baby up for adoption, my son up for adoption. And uh, then I got a phone call and they said, Bridget, dad is dead. And mom, my mom had had a massive aneurysm and she had it when she was at the hospital waiting to visit my dad. Is that like Swedish? One of the hospitals here, big, whatever. Like she's in the waiting room, waiting to go see my dad and then drops. And that's the only reason she lived is because it was so massive. They put her right into um, surgery. So I got this phone call that mom's, mom's had a massive aneurysm, dad's dead. A couple days later, when you're, when you're an advanced late stage chronic alcoholic, um, my mom hadn't drank in a couple of days. And so what happened, and I don't know if somebody's medical physician, I don't know all the ins and outs of it. This is all I'm hearing this up in Alaska. 
um, her brain kind of short circuited even further when she went into DTs after her brain surgery. So whatever happened there. So she lived, but she was never herself again. She knew I was one of the kids, but she never knew my name after that. She kind of guess at it, run through the list. Um, and she was pretty, a lot of cognitive damage. So that was August of 87. And I had found a boyfriend. I had settled on one. I had gotten it down to one guy. <laughs> Took a while. Well, one for the most part. We'll use the term one loosely. One. I got it down to one-ish guy. Okay. And um, so the ladies, I can hear you guys laughing because it's really late. <laughs> You're my good. These are my girlfriends. These are my people. You're my people. So I gotten it down to one, and, and he was kind of cool. He was really nice. And I had shot pool with him and stuff when we were uh, when I was drinking. Apparently, he wasn't. Could never figure out why he wouldn't drink with me. But he shot for a good game of pool, and I, I hustled pool and um, and hustled. Okay, I, I hustled a lot of pool. And, um, <laughs> And I went into a meeting one day and uh, he came up to me and he kneeled beside me and um, he, he knelt down by my chair and he looked up at me and he said, I always knew you'd get here. And I looked at him and went, so that's why you don't drink. <laughs> and he said, yeah. And uh, we fell in mad, passionate bed. And... Uh, <laughs> And I had flown down to Seattle and we'd buried my dad and done, dealt with my mom and stuff and flew back to Kodiak. And um, we had a wonderful romance. And on November 14th, I celebrated one year and we were really happy and joyous. And he lived over on the mainland. He had a house on the mainland. And um, on November 23rd, he, I put him on a plane and he flew back to the mainland and his plane crashed and he was killed. Oh. And um, this is my first year of sobriety. And on January 24th, I had my son and I, I gave him up in the first open adoption in Kodiak history. And um, my son is now like 32, 33, 33. I don't know, but he's made me a grandma. And I'm still writing about it. So that was my first year of sobriety. So for me, my first year was very traumatic. So just my old timers keeping me, just go to meetings, kid. Don't worry about the details, okay? We do service. What service work looked like was baiting tubs, building fishing gear, fixing, repairing crab pots, cutting wood, going out to Chiniac, going out to Thumbs Up and helping old Joe lay in stock, stock wood for the winter helping bait tubs, doing that kind of stuff. You know, we put the literature out and we write the steps on the board. <laughs> and that was it, bring in cookies, putting the literature out, literature, the literature table was like, like an altar. That was a big deal, man. Was it just me or was, did everybody have that same experience? Literature table still to me is like, it's like, oh, I love doing literature because I can go, you lay it out, and there's a way that you lay it out, and you take the big book and you stand it upright. Yes. Let's yes. see. Yes. You know, yes. you know. Anyway, yeah, to stand the big book up so that everyone can see it, and I'm like Vanna White. You know? <laughs> so y'all know where you're at. This isn't an Amway convention. <laughs> Again. <laughs> and that's how they taught me. That's how I found out the joy and the laughter. See, that's how you tell a healthy group. There's a lot of talk about, but there's a lot of laughter. I came in here tonight and everybody's, you got me. She's got, we got the best coffee in any of the meetings around here. I'm like, yeah, baby. <laughs> Hit me up. Pour. I'm gacked on your coffee right now. Jesus. <laughs> like trying not to slob. <laughs> There's a good distance between me and my cup over there, but that's okay. I'll talk fast. <laughs> and it was all modeled for me. The joy, a lot of laughter. There's a lot of talk about God in healthy meetings. 
And I came in here with no God, man. I came in here being terrified. How do you turn your will and your life over the care of a God that you're terrified of and pissed off at? They said, don't worry about it, kid. Just you believe in God. It's like, well, I got a lot. They're like, good enough. Good enough. Keep it simple. See, I had been raised with a mean and punishing God. You better be good, kid, or God's going to get you. I'm screwed. I got knocked up the first time when I was, before I knew where babies came from. I'm done. I'm screwed when it comes to God. And they gently pulled me aside one night. Old Lynn L. pulled me aside. And she said, Bridget, you can fire that mean and punishing God. And I went, Scooby moment. <laughs> what? I'm waiting for lightning, lightning bolts. She said, you can fire that mean and punishing God and get one that's nice. <coughs> I'm like, I might be able to work with this. Then I'd go to the meetings and all the Coast Guard guys, they'd say God and the F word in the same sentence and lightning bolts never came down. Not like F God, but like God and F in the same sentence. And I thought, oh, I'm home. That's cool. It's not cool, cool, but wow. Maybe it's okay. And, 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 and old Mike, whatever his last name was in the Coast Guard, in his irreverence, and he'd talk about Big Daddy Junior and the spook. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I realized what he was talking about. And I went, that is so inappropriate, but oh my God, maybe, I, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's okay for me to go ahead and grasp onto a God that's kind and loving. And all powerful. Maybe it'll be okay. See, because I came in with all those prejudices, and the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous asked me to lay aside those prejudices. Ugh. I ain't prejudice. Yeah, I was. And and you guys made it easier for me to lay aside those prejudices and express even a willingness to believe. Okay, maybe just maybe. See, I didn't think this would work for me. Because nothing had worked for me. Not this alcoholic. And I had tried. I had tried everything. I had tried putting it down, walking away, picking, <laughs> taking a trip, not taking a trip, swearing off forever with and without a solemn rope, you know, switching from Scott to Brand Scott to uh, Scotch to Brandy and Scott to Randy. <laughs> you know? That's an Ashley joke. I tried it all, swearing off forever with and without a solemn oath. I tried it all, man. I tried moving. See, I'd hitchhike. I'd land places. And my parents would fly me back. My dad would, well, anyway, my dad, I'd fly back on passes. They'd always fly me back to SeaTac. Fly me. I ended up in Texas and Florida and all those places. And they'd fly me back to SeaTac. Can't tell you how many times I walked across 2 a.m. at the old SeaTac. There's my mom in her slippers. Oh my God. I was on Amazon looking at slippers. They still make those things, the little mule things. Oh my gosh. All those times I had tried it, swore. This time it's going to be different. Never going to happen again. To no avail. And then you said, but there's only one that's going to be able to help you. And I went, okay, maybe, just maybe, God can help me. Maybe, just maybe. And I walked a day at a time. I moved back down here after the oil spill um, in 90. And um, my very first AA conference ever was the 90 world. <laughs> So they've all paled in comparison ever since. <laughs> Y'all need to step up your games, right? <laughs> so that was my first day of conference. And my mind was blown. And I saw all you guys with your cowboy hats on. And I thought, shit, I'm in Texas again. <laughs> and I got to see that AA exists here in this place where I had caused so much wreckage. Because I did. We were talking about it a bit ago. Man, I caused a, I caused a lot of wreckage I can never repair here in Seattle. 
I hurt a lot of people. Um, what I get to do today is I get to celebrate my life a day at a time. I get the opportunity to sponsor and, and walk shoulder to shoulder with a crap ton of people that I have absolutely no idea why God has found it necessary for, you know, for me to have this opportunity to walk beside such amazing people that, that are, oh my God, that one is five minutes faster than my watch. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Um, I don't know why, but, but here we are. I take it as a personal responsibility to pass it on, that which has been so freely given to me. I get the honor and privilege to take, to, to sponsor a lot of people, to do a lot of stuff. We get to do remote communities and um, say yes anytime I'm asked. Um, and the next phase of my adventure is I'm gonna now dump the remote communities and um, my husband and I, my, my in-laws are getting old and they're, they live in Texas. So this spring in April, we're moving down to Texas, um, taking our show on the road. And so we'll see what that season of my life takes me to, takes us to. Um, my husband's a very great Al-Anon and, um, and it's a privilege and an honor to walk this journey. Um, I don't know if I've said anything that makes any sense. But, um, you know, if you're miserable in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, man, you ain't doing it right. She's got my phone number. She's got my phone number. My phone number's on every Alano club from here, the bathroom wall, every Alano club from here to, you know. Um, but, man, reach out. You know, I don't know if I've said anything that makes any difference or any sense to you tonight. I hope I have. Thank you again for allowing me. There's a great place over here that sells burgers called Katsu Burger. Yes. Remote Communities is December 4th, and I'm going to go ahead and cut it off there because I didn't realize that clock was fast. Thanks. <laughs>